So, well, this is why uh, we Ibn Arabi is not to be systematized. He can't be. He's not a systematic thinker, as they might say. Uh, because he gives us one truth, and he really, we've got to stay with that truth and understand it completely. And then he gives you another truth, which is very, very different, and you've got to stay with that one as well. So the truth we had last week was that you are the most tremendous name, and that because of this extremal variety, or this extreme variety, that everything is equally indicative of the Creator. And so there's no one event or one person or one entity or one event that's more indicative of God than any other. And this is the, the statement, no soul is better than Pharaoh's soul. So that statement comes out as the, the, you know, the person who thinks that his soul is better than Pharaoh's soul doesn't understand the situation. And what we'll get in this next slide here is that we're going to be having this one statement about the gem core, the Jauhar. <clears throat> so let's see if I can move everything so I can see everything at the same time. Sorry. Um, so the universe, <clears throat> all of him in the place of his gem core, is noble, so Sharif. And there is no differential excellence in him in this universe. And so the worm and the first intellect are the same in regard to the excellence of their gem core. And of course, they're both the same in their indicative nature to the divine. So the difference is, and this is where the second truth comes that we're supposed to understand, the difference and the differentials of excellence appear in the images. So the shadow puppet behind the screen, they have the material that makes them, is the gem core, is the same in a worm and in the first intellect. So they are, they are the same and they are equally valuable, just the way all the names are equally valuable. But there is this step level, these different sets, and they have properties which make them more excellent or less excellent. So the first set is the messenger, then the next set are prophets, then the third set are friends, and then the fourth set are the faithful. So there are the noble and the more noble, and the lowered and the more lowered. So what we, this helps us see is that instead of looking at the world where truth and reality and all these things are fixed in a place, in a space and time, or fixed in a thing, we're beginning to see that it's the relationship of these entities which makes a difference. And so it's interesting that in quantum mechanics and physics, there's a choice with the evidence and the data that comes in and the double slit experiment. There's a choice. You can have determinism or you can have locality, but you can't have both. So determinism is when the ball hits the left side, that ball will shoot off to the right. That's determinism. Non-determinism would mean when the ball hits the other ball, there's a probability that it will go left or right. And then locality means that things that are close have more influence and things that are far away can be ignored because they don't have any influence. And then non-locality means that wherever you are in the universe, you are equally connected and everything is equally important and influential. So physics, uh, in a sense, dropped the idea that there should be non-locality. They said, we want, de we, want, we want locality. We want things that are local to be important. So that meant they had to embrace non-determinism. So when this happened, Einstein says, God does not play dice. So he was very upset with non-determinism. And then Schrodinger came up with, the square root of negative one dead cat and a square root of negative one alive cat. And so until you open the box, you don't know which is which, and then the waveform will collapse and you'll get something. So this was, these were uh, rebellions against this choice that we should choice, choose non-determinism in order to save locality. But if we choose, and so the question is why, why, is, why were people willing to give up on determinism 
maybe because they just didn't like non-locality. So non-locality means that things happen wherever they happen, whenever they happen, and they have equal influence. And so we look at, uh, you know, my favorite book again, <clears throat> The Comte de Monte Cristo. And the, I, of course, we start with the entity is one, and then the properties are many. So Ibn Arabi throughout the Futuhat is saying, al ain wahta, the entity is one, and then he says, but the properties are many, or the divine names are many, or our names are many, the relationships are many, so that's a grammatical relationship. Someone is a child of X, X is child of Y, that's a relationship, there are many of those. The states are many, so what state you're in are many, multiple. The colors, Talween, the coloration of everything is many. And then the variegations are many, the tasrif. That's to put a serif. So you have in fonts, you have serif and non and sans serif. So serif is this extra that's added, it variegates, changes the letter. So in this one, uh, years ago, a falcon bites the ear of Heidi, and so she gets a, a bite on her ear, a cut from on her earlobe, which 20 years later gives her the uh, authentication in her témoin, when she gives witness, that accuses and proves that Ferdinand, the Count of Morcef, is a betrayer, a traitor, and therefore he also traded Dantes. And then once that happens, Albert, his son, has to defend the right of his father. So he accuses the count and challenges to a duel. And the count, that's when Mercedes, Albert's mother, comes over in the middle of the night and says, Edmond, first time he hears his name, Edmond, don't kill my child. So there we have something that happened long ago and far away, brings together this confluence of events, which makes this one moment of the recognition, Edmond, and the first time he hears his name from Mercedes. So this far away things, far away in time, far away in place, how they have the impact on a moment that is so, that's, which becomes the moment that needs to be known and done. So this vast space is the vast earth, and every part of this vast earth is connected so the physicist David Bohm said it's an implicate order, that the order is implicated and folded in. So if you take a, a hook and pull out a little bit of this thread, you'll get an individual, an indivisible being, an individual. And you can take out another one, pull out a little bit of thread, and it stands up and says, hi, I'm an individual, I'm indivisible. And yet, that indivisible individual is the fabric of this entire vast earth. And this is how Ibn Arabi tells us, the bodily earth of yours, just the way you are the most tremendous name, your bodily earth in the true dimension is an earth of God, Allah's vast earth. And you are commanded to worship Allah in her, in this vast earth, in your body. So something in this fabric, wherever it might be, space and time, the question then becomes, when, what hap why is it so important? Because we thought that all events are equally important. Well, now all events are equally indicative of Allah, but that doesn't mean that they are not special ones. And the special ones are the ones that are put in you in order for you to find something. Um, and so we have, we'll have, uh, Marta, if you read this now, as, can you see everything all right? Yeah. Okay. Now learn, you who are listening, that with the family of God, when the true attracts them to him exalted beyond, such as a murid who wants God, or a murad who is wanted by God, he makes in their hearts a caller inviting them to seek their felicity 
and to dig deeper for her and to scratch out a hollow for her as a nest in the earth and dust for laying eggs and as a hollowed out place in the hot ashes for the lump of dough to be baked. And they find in their hearts a tenderness and a lowering and a search for peace and freedom from what people are up to with their rabbit rushing and their envying one another and they're turning their backs to each other and their mutual shunning and aversion. And then when they fully complete the generous virtues or they get close to completing them, they find in themselves a caller inviting them to retreats and being alone, away from people. Among them, some take to journeys and stay fast to the mountains and the empty deserts. And among them, so, some have their journeys in the country. Everything people of the country are familiar with and are accustomed to, they leave, departing for something else. And among them, some set themselves apart in their houses, making them a lodge, to be alone in there and to be curtained off from people. All of this is in order to bring about for them solitude and independence in the true who called them to who and to intimacy with who. So thank you, yeah. Yeah, so this, what we're looking at here is that the divine is searching for you. And so you get a caller put into yourself and that caller brings you to do different things. And you'll all know this from your life, whether you're, which of the three of those you are. Are you someone who goes off to be alone? Are you someone who stays in the city, but then is always moving in a different direction and so ends up being alone? Or someone who stays inside the house and, and, and is in a lodge in the house to be alone. So this desire to become alone is because a caller had been placed in you, calling you to be alone. So that you can then, so that Allah can find you. And so, and so this finding is uh, what we're looking at now. And this takes place uh, not necessarily in spatial time places very close to us, but could be from very, very far away. And because all of this is then interconnected. Okay. Okay, now we have an Ilahi. Deep nightingale, send your two swing with us. As from the road, I got in the cueta. Alapodi, and is a friend. Oh, give us a saving, saving. Leave my song. Because of you. As long in road, deeper and deeper, singing in the pen of things of ours. is bold lover, question the source of being, why this of light into the veil of creation, though the light of the application can touch a man as a Hmm. 
Thank you. So this is the flying in the veils of creation. So we'll look at what happens with these veils of creation, what that happens to the one who loves the sight before the veils of creation take place, the pre-eternal vision. So in this pre-eternal vision, we have the story of Bayazid Bastami. And so as for Abu Yazid, he was not able for Ar-Rahman to go and settle on the throne. From Quran, we know that Ar-Rahman went and settled on the throne of the cosmic throne of this, uh, of which is a tiny uh, well inside this vast earth. And he could not bear the pain. So he was thunderstruck then and there. So he exalted, said, bring him, my beloved, back to me because he has no endurance apart from me. Then he was veiled by love and intimate address. So this, bring him back to me. So after this, the pre-eternal vision, that Abu Yazid was not able to then continue into the veils of creation, into the veils of creation. It was too painful, could not endure it. And so he was told, bring him back to me. And so come back to the beloved. Now, this is the direct in the pre-eternal time. And then if this takes place in the veils of creation, the rest of us are called back by mirages. So the mirage is that collar. So we have a collar put inside. We have a collar, a, a collar calling out to us, which is in a mirage as well. It's what we need. And so, uh, and what we need could be, could be the most mundane uh, thing in the world. And so, or it could be uh, a mundane thing, a worldly thing, which is still important like water. So we come to this mirage thinking we're finding what we have been attracted to. We've attracted to water. And then we realize when we get there, that the reason we were attracted to come here was so that Allah would find us. And we would find Allah. So, وَلَذِينَ كَفْرُوا أَمَالَهُمْ So this, the ones who kafir, that the kafir, kufr, and the kafir, uh, is also connected to covering. So kufr, which you think infidelity or disbelief, all these things, also means sitr, which is to cover something. So the people who are covered up, and they don't know that everything is indicative and equally indicative of God, they're covered up from that truth, they see God in what they need. For in this case, water. Or in other cases, anything very mundane which has attracted you. So this verse, uh, translated with this understanding, then is like a mirage in the empty desert. The thirsty one reckons his water. Until when he reaches there, he finds nothing. But he finds God before him. And who fulfills him completely. So his sab here is fulfilling you completely, giving you sufficiency, what you need. And who is swift in fulfilling sufficiency. So you might, uh, if you know the traditional or, or more uh, conventional understanding of hisab, you think it's, oh, uh, he's quick to account. He's going to get these guys now. No, quick to be sufficient, to give to hisab what you deserve and what you need. And what you need is God. So what you, when you, so you find, well, wajada Allahu indahu. So then you find before you Allah. And we'll have, uh, we could have a uh, class read this part for us. I found my heart here more than at Al Munarat. And I found it there. I also, as the Sheikh said, and he understood 
that it was because of the ones who inhabit this site. The sites of the righteous ones who have passed away from this world, yet their traces remain in their sites, influencing subtle hearts there. You might find your heart in one mosque more than in another. This is not on account of the earth composing the adobes, but is because the same earths who sit there or their energies still stir. I have no doubt from Kash and from information that even though the angels inhabit the entire earth with their superiority in recognitions and ranks, the highest in rank and greatest in information and knowledge are inhabiting the sacred precinct. He, blessings and peace be upon him, was hailed on the night of the night ascension in his distillation by the voice of Abu Bakr, and he was cheered by the sound of Abu Bakr, messenger of God, and Abu Bakr came from a single clay. Muhammad came first, and Abu Bakr followed second. Thank you. Yeah, this is the, the same earths, the people who come from the same earth. And Ibn Arabi elsewhere uh, describes this hadith by saying that these are the people that when you meet them, suddenly you understand each other and you speak the same. And it's as if you, one finishes the sentence of the other. And then when you meet people who are not of the same earth, then these are the ones that you're always arguing with and you're always irritable at. <laughs> so this is how this same earth works. And of course, the sight of the righteous ones who have passed away from this world, yet their traces remain and they influence subtle hearts. So this is why the Sufis and the, the people on the mystic path are always searching out these special places. So we started with the idea that every name is the same, every uh, event in every place is equally indicative of, of, of God and the divine and all of that's true but there also are special places and these special places are the ones that you are attracted to you've been called to go to and when you go there you find the same earths people of the same earths who are like you and who you feel they understand and so uh, even the Prophet Sallallahu who understands that every place is equally valuable and equally indicative of the divine, still it's Abu Bakr, the same clay voice that hails him and in his desolation. Ibn Arabi says, this tells you that, the, that this night ascension was in the body, was a physical one and not uh, an imaginal one, a dream one, because he had many, many dream ones, but he also had this physical one. And we have dream ones. We have dream night ascensions. And so he says, desolation only occurs when you are physical. So if you're in a dream, you can't feel desolate because you are, because that's when you see that everything is this vast earth. Okay. And so to stay with Majnun and Layla, we have this, this Ilahi. I'll go mute myself. Lover and beloved, union of love sublime. Lover and beloved, union of love sublime. Oh, soul, ton of love, what can I say but yes, 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 oh, ton of love, yes.
yes. Forever, yes. Mejnoon and Layla, bodies are made of love. Shems and Mevlana, bodies are made of love. Oh, Sultan of love, what can I say but yes, 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 oh, Tana, la, yes, forever, yes. Body is a hollow reed laid by the storm of love. Mind is a hollow reed laid by the storm of love. Where in all the worlds can we find such ecstasy? Lost in thee and found in thee, we are you and you are we. Nur of Aziz sings this song of love. Nur of Ashki dreams this dream of love. Where in all the worlds can we find such ecstasy lost in thee and found in thee? We are you and who are we? Thank you. Yeah. So now this. So we've been looking at uh, so lost in this divine and also found in this divine, and all of these uh, pulls and attractions, things we are drawn to are callers that the divine has placed in us to call us to where we need to go. Now the problem or with these callers is that they also agree, bring great pain. And so we have this amazing passage where Ibn Arabi takes the first few verses uh, from Surah Al-Baqarah, which uh, whenever I've always read them, it's always been, oh boy, these awful people. These awful people who can't listen to God and can't listen to the messenger and their ears are covered up and their eyes are, have a veil over them and, they, and all these things and, and they just, why just can't they see religion and, and, and spirituality and good things? Ah, but Ibn Arabi has quite another way of looking at this. And uh, Omar's been looking at this for a while and uh, he's come up, he might have a different translation because we've been going back and forth about what's the best way to convey some of this. So Omar, I'll turn it over to you and mute my mic. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna al-Ladina kafaru sawa'un alayhu anzartuhum an lam tundiruhum la yu'minun. ختم الله على قلوبهم وعلى سماعهم وعلى أفصارهم غشاوة ولهم عذاب عظيم. The English translation is those who have veiled themselves. It is the same for them whether you warn them or you do not warn them. They will not believe. God has put a seal on their hearts and on their hearing, and on their sight there is a cloudy mist, a cloudy haze. And to them is a great torment. Do you want? Do you want to go ahead and, and read Ibn Arabi's part as well? All right. Yeah. Uh, a short explanation is this: O Muhammad, the one who cover up, whose love for me is covering them up, it is the same to them whether you warn them with your threats, which I sent, sent you with, or you do not warn them, they will not believe in your words because they do not understand anyone but me. And you are warning them with my creation, 
the fire and they do not understand it with their minds, nor do they see it with their eyes. And how could they believe in you? I have sealed their hearts and I did not make any room in there for other than me and over their ears so they do not hear words in the world except from me. And over their sight is a cloudy cover, an afterglow from my radiance after seeing me. So they do not see anyone but me. They are in great pain because of me, as I sent them after this brilliant vision to your warning. And I veiled them from me, just as I did with you. O Muhammad, after you were two bows length or even nearer, so close, I sent you down to someone who would call you a liar and throw what I sent with you to them from me back in your face. And you heard them say about me things that constricted your chest. Then there was that clarity that I showed you in your night ascension. In this way are the ones con entrusted with me, with my creation, the ones I conceal being well pleased with them, and I would never be unhappy with them, ever. Look at how he conceals his friends in the guise of his enemies. He, exalted says, the ones who cover up, that is, they cover up what happened to them in their vision, such as secret connections. So he says, of course I would veil you from my that, by my adjectives, so, so be ready for it. But they were not prepared, so I warned them on the tongue of my prophet, messengers, prophets and messengers sent to, the, to, to that world. But they did not understand because they were in the eye of the wall itself. He spoke to them from differentiation herself, and they did not recognize the world of separate distinctions. So they were not prepared. And love's dominion had taken over their hearts because of jealousy in the part of the true for them in the moment. Thus, he informed his prophet by spirit and by Quran of the reason they stayed mute instead of responding to what he had called them to. And he said, God had sealed their hearts. Their hearts are not spacious enough to contain anyone else but him and their ears, so they do not hear anything but his words in the world's tongue, and they witness him in the world speaking in in the world's in the world speaking in the people's language, and over their sight is a cloudy cover from his radiant afterglow, as he is light, and his brilliance as majesty, as reverent awe belong to him, meaning the attribute which he gave them in Tajalli earlier. He leaves them drowning in the ocean of pleasure in seeing the Zat, who, and he says to them, you will certainly be in great pain, but they do not understand what pain is because what pain is because of the integrity of attributes giving them pleasure standing before the vision of their cherished in Alestu. Then he brings out to them the world of existence and decay. And at that moment, he teaches them all the names and he sends them down to the cosmic throne of Ar-Rahman who settled there and there was their pain. They are concealed from him in the treasure troves of his unseen. When the angels see them, they fall prostrate before them and they teach them the names. And as for Abu Yazid, he was not able for the supremely compassionate going and, 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 and settling, or settling on the throne. And he could not bear the pain. So he was thunderstruck then and there. That he exalted said, he exalted said, bring him my beloved back to me because he has no endurance apart from me. Then he was veiled by love and intimate address. And so they remain kuffar, intrigate, intrigates covered up. Thank you. 
yeah, well, so when, when I read Ibn Arabi's description of this for the first time, I thought, wow, so <laughs> this, is, this is such an amazing passage. They remain kufar, they remain these disbelievers or ingrates, but what they do is they remain covered up because of jealousy, because Allah wants them only for him. And so these are like the malamiya who blame themselves and other people blame them, the malamiya, and that's out of jealousy as well, that no one should see that these are special people. So they come out as very unspecial people and they are blamed uh, by others for not being more special or more pious. But uh, what a path this is. And yet, yet with all of this pain, we hear this one being well pleased. I would never be unhappy with them ever. So this is the, the beautiful spot. Okay. And then the other way that, so these are the kufar, the people who cover up. But then let's also look at the mushrikin, the people who have shirk. Those are the idolaters. So let's look at them as well. So he's, he exalted said about hub. Hub is a word for love in Arabic. But the ones who have faith are most intense in love of God. Walladina amanu ashaddu hubban lillah. This is because when the veil is lifted off in kashf, the ones, the idols, who were being followed, declare themselves clear of the ones who followed. It's not my responsibility. And the ones who followed say, if only we had one more chance, we would declare ourselves clear of them, just as they declared themselves clear of, uh, of us. So we would mutually reject each other. Their love for the idols disappears in that situation on the day of judgment, and they remain faithful with their love of God. Thus, they are the most intense in love of God because they exceed the other faithful people at the moment their love for their gods is completely retracted when their gods do not back them up at all with God. So on the day of judgment, the idolaters will have nothing but their love of God alone. In this world, they loved him and they loved their idols, since they thought them gods. And if not for that assumption and that error, they would not have loved them. Therefore, their real object of love was only divinity, and they imagined her to be in the many. They loved who and they loved the idols. So when the arising for judgment comes, just as we said, there will remain with them nothing but their love of God. This is why they are in the next world more intense in love of Allah compared to the love they had for him in this world, since their love here was divided, but it consolidates in the next world. As they see what they love, and it is divinity, they see her only in him alone. That is why merciful kindness outstrips wrath and wins. That's why Rahma is the horse that comes from the back and outstrips wrath and grabs the stake, which is humanity, and says, I've got you. And that's Rahma. So Rahma outstrips wrath and wins. And why the two extreme gyres are strengthened. So there are these two whirlpools here, and there's Shirk, the idol in the middle. And when the idol is seen to be nothing but God because of divinity, then the two gyres then become stronger and stronger and the middle weakens. So this is another geometry of Ibn Arabi. And so let me go ahead and read these two poems. You've heard this before. I was connected to the one I love for 20 years and I wasn't aware of whom I was loving and I knew no patience. And my eye had not gazed toward the goodness of her face, and my ears had not heard any dhikr mentioning her at all, until the lightning flashed into my view from a side projected. He blessed me one day, and he tormented me forever after. While I was for 20 years a dragoman for love, he was embracing my secret heart. I didn't know whom I loved, and I didn't know his name. And I didn't know who this was who compressed my chest until there shone to me her face through her niqab like a night cloud drifting from the full moon. So, 
So let's look at the, this imagery of after effect, because what happened with those people, the very special people who we don't know are special, they saw the brilliant radiant light and that damaged their eyes. It gave them this cloudiness in their eyes. So the after effect, so the retina was burned through with this light and the, and the outside becomes cloudy and the retina becomes scarred like an after effect. There's also body memory. So you have in your body uh, neurological cells which have memory. And these are places that the caller has been put. The caller gets put there so that you will find it. So do you know that when you, when you have, we all know that when we have a, when we hit your, if you hit your elbow, suddenly all your attention is focused on the elbow. So that pain, in a, what it did was it brought all your attention. And so the pain that's coming up in the lover is coming up in order to bring all the attentions to one place, to that caller that needs to be heard. And so there's body memory and then scar. And scar, Ibn Arabi has used the imagery of scar uh, for, it can be, it, in Arabic, it's, it can be transposed. So regret can be also a scar. So something that you regret, you know, that you can, we say, you know, you look back and you have regrets. Those are things that you focused on that happened a long time ago. And they are like scars. And they bring your attention there. They bring your focus there. So he's going to describe the difference between tajalli, which is that brilliant radiance, which is happening every moment with every breath, and khawatir, these incoming thoughts, or these thoughts bestirring the mind. So these hawatir, the plural, are all of them divine addresses. So here they are, the divine speaking directly to you. They are not tajaliyat. This is why God configures them as images, new, in the mist, which is the breath of the divine. So the divine breathes out, there's the mist, and in this mist, all of these things are happening. Now, whoever witnesses them, if God does not nourish you with knowledge of what we cited, you imagine that the Khawatir are divine, brilliant radiances, the Jaliyat, since one sees them as images. So you call, these memories, these, these bestirring thoughts, they can be body memories, after effects, scars, regrets, and so on, they are seen as images, so you have a visual memory of them. But this is the reason they are called khawatir. You see, they do not stabilize, just as the image of the letter does not stabilize in being after the tongue has articulated it. So the letter is spoken, and then it goes off, and it's not to be seen again. It's not stabilized. The letter has only the time of its articulation, so the moment that alif, the lam, the word, the name was as articulated, that's its time. And then it is voided and disappears. But a screen projection, a mithal, a screen projection remains in the understanding of the one who is listening as an image of the letter. So you hear this letter and it hits you and it sticks either retinally or orally or body memorally, it sticks as a screen projection, something that you can look at. And you can look at even though the, the event is long gone, or even though the person is long gone, the image still remains. One imagines that this bestirring thought remains just as imagine of Duna Nun about his word, am I not your cherisher? Alastu. So he said, it is as if this is in my ear now and forever. But it is not a sentence which he hears. No, it is the remnant of an image of the sentence, the understanding grasped and retained. Grasped and retained. So this capturing of that sentence is captured as a film capture, as a photo capture, as an image capture. Therefore, it was stabilized and fixed in the soul. So it then lodges in the soul, and it's there to be seen and examined and reflected upon 
and asked questions of and uh, and study to dig deep into. So it's like we had way back up at the Leila, the, the one about the, the collar is the, the hollow that's made inside. So that hollow is where you put the bread in the ashes and then it warms up and it bakes that way. So that hollow is a place that's been created to have the, the collar there or to have the image, the projecting image there so that it can then be protected by the ashes around or the, the earth around so that it can then be protected and then can bake and grow and can be seen and understood. So that's the process of this. This is also, we may look at this next week, we should probably look at dreams at some point. The Dobie's mark, the launderer's mark, Ibn Arabi's imagery of that when the soul is taken away from the body and goes off into this vast earth, that there's a mark made on the soul because nothing can come through the barzakh, this barrier, this membrane barrier is absolute. There's two sides and nothing goes through it. So the soul, which has to have a mark on it, which when it then reemerges, when Allah puts it back into the body, it reemerges with this mark. And you study this mark in order to understand the dream. Okay. So let's, we'll just take a moment and then we'll, we'll listen to our wonderful uh, singing from Farida too. Okay. So let me make sure we get this shared screen correctly. Okay. <laughs> Let me just make sure, was everyone able to hear that? Okay, good, sorry, good. Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I think uh, also on a technical matter, I think I probably I I I goofed up the uh, the announcements and things like that. Let's go ahead and keep having a weekly one. That's I'm easy easiest one to forget. So let's have weekly. And if you could, everyone could put in your name in the chat. I learned this from Mustafa. Write in your name in the chat so that I have a copy of your name. That way I can make sure that you're on Mustafa's list, which I didn't help him prepare this week, and on another list that I have too. So please put everyone's, type your name in, and so that way I can make sure everyone's on there. And uh, Fez from Kerala was mentioning that a few people missed it from there. So, uh, so please feel free to put your name there, and Fez, if you have other people you know that missed, make sure you type their name in there too. Okay. Uh, good now, it's all coming in, that's good. Um, so the, the, there's a, a question about the caller. Is the caller, uh, who is the caller? Um, and, and the caller is, is going to be uh, an event, a thing, a person, a place, but it's something that calls you. Um, in the Sufi path, we usually understand this as the teacher has called you, the Sheikha. And so the teacher calls you and, uh, and reaches out the right hand, and you take that right hand of assistance. And so that's the, that's the, the way. Um, the, and the, the, so the, that's why we call these things a teacher. And Ibn Arabi called uh, his teachers then, all of those who invited him, called him to something that he then learned. So it could be a cheetah, a horse, a rain spout, um, and then his his earth, uh, his same earth friends, Abu Madian, who died before he could meet meet them in this world, but they would meet all the time in the other world. And so this meeting also is that beautiful uh, passage that that Klaus read about the these same earths are there in these tombs, and so we visit them, and we and they uh, they give us things that that they answer us because we've been called to go there. And if you remember my friend from uh, two weeks ago, Javed, uh, we went around to Bole Shah's tomb and uh, he would say that, that this is this, this amazingly miraculous place because this is where the subtle hearts learn what they need to learn from the one that they were attracted to. And then the, the, this, these, uh, these clay mates, <laughs> these people are the same earths. Uh, they're the soul family, yes. So, and so this is the, the family that you then find. And, they, and uh, if you're fortunate, they could be your natural family or they can be your new family. Um, and as uh, 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 we, a few a month ago, I was telling you about this, as I was growing up, this feeling of not belonging. Well, uh, it's sort of, so then you find you be, find that you belong to that community of people who don't belong. <laughs> and so belonging to the community of people who don't belong, that's when you find your same earth people. So, 
Um, let me keep looking at that. And, and if you have anything, let me just to speak up and I'll be ahead and going through the chats also. Anything I need to look at. But please, any ideas or questions, please let me know. Okay. Good. This is good. Uh, yes. Salam. Well, salam, Raftallah, please, please. Um, Shweb, I, I wanted to ask you more about the ones who cover. Um, so we, does that mean that also the Rasulullah, peace be upon him, was also one who was covered? And also, does that mean that everyone who is, um, you know, um, let's say what we would consider an adversary or negative or is, has been covered by a lot that they are also beloveds in that sense even you know is in other words that means simply everyone has been struck and they have been particularly struck by the radiance maybe couldn't bear the radiance and then became covered up and negative even in their own mind or th this i'm not quite clear about that now, yeah, it's the fasting. The, what, what I keep looking at is, uh, is that for the, for the Prophet ﷺ, uh, that one statement he made, he said that there are times when I can only be with my cherisher. So there are times when I can only be with my cherisher. And what, to, for me, to reading between the lines, and this, I, of course, must be getting from Ibn Arabi somewhere, but the idea then is that as a prophet, he has to be fortified. He has to be strong and people have to see him because when he says how to pray, he doesn't give you a list. He says, pray as you see me pray. So he has to be visible. He has to be recognizable. Mm -hmm. um, so that's not like the other ones who that God's jealousy keeps them from being seen. Now, this one has to be seen. But even though he has to be seen and therefore has to have uh, an outward sense of, of beauty and veracity and all of that, still, he says, there are times when I only have time with my cherisher. So there are times when he then apart and says, I'm now no longer, you know, for you to look at me, I, this is, that's his time and that's his special time. And so to teach us, he has to be visibly verac veracious and true but he also has his own path, which is when he's alone with his cherisher. And that's not when anyone looks at him. This is also why he asked for the curtain. The curtain came down, the veil came down so that he could be alone, alone with uh, his, his wives and alone within the family and then protected by this cloak of, of curtain, of the parda, of the veil. And so, and, and so Ibn Arabi says that, that some of the enemies of God that you see, not necessarily all of them, but some of them will be the ones who are being deliberately hidden so that, uh, that they can be special to God. And in a sense, we see that when you, can, when you find someone who is so obstinate, so stubborn about something, you realize that that stubbornness or that, they say, oh, I just can't stand the Sufis, or I just can't stand this or that, or I can't stand Muslims or whatever it is. And someone who's so stubborn, and you realize that that just doesn't come from inside and from events. Something has made that person say, I can't stand these Sufis. And what happens is the next year you meet the person and he's the greatest Sufi in the world because he was kept from that, <laughs> obstinate and stubborn. And so some people are just naturally stubborn, but some people you can just say, oh, something is really blocking this guy from seeing what's going on here. And there's, and this also because the, the time that things come, you see, so that, that which attracts you, the water, you have this water all the time, but why is it you go out to the desert to, and you see this mirage and that attracted you? So that's, again, there are times when you're called. And so all things are equally indicative of Allah. But when you are called, then that thing suddenly becomes the one that is the, the one that you are called to. Mm -hmm. and, but this, uh, f for those we're speaking of who were blinded or so struck by the radiance is that from pure eternity then that experience and then they came into the world veiled or covered yeah yeah no that looks like the the, the pre-eternity one and you know, i don't know enough about 
um, ophthalmology, and uh, Abdul Haq is going to do his ophthalmology surgery very soon. But my, what reading the sort of under, trying to explore the words for this gauzy veil, this Bishwa, and then and Omar, you know, got me to say, let's look at this really carefully. Um, it's when the when the pre-eternal Alastib, am I not your Lord? Am I not your cherisher? And that beauty is so powerful that it clouds when the person then is into a enters the the fetus which is in the womb for a few months and then enters that fetus, then the soul has a subtle influence on the body. And so the body becomes reproduces this blindness blinded by the light as the song says this blindness is reproduced in the in the body that's growing in the womb and so this person then seems to come out with the soul and the soul the, the psychosomatic the soul and the bodily interaction creates a kind of uh this this uh, cloudiness in the eyes and so i think that they physically are clouded over but also uh, clouded over soulfully clouded over as well and uh, it just was so big and then Allah says to them right after that you know uh, you're going to be in great pain warning them right you're going to be in great pain and you've seen my zat but now you're going to have to see my adjectives and my adjectives are all not always as nice as the ones that you've just seen so these adjectives these sifat are going to be yours to see and they say Oh, we're just so happy they're in such bliss. And then when they get born, now they find out, oh boy, this is what was talked about. Look at all these adjectives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, there's just a note that came. So should we look at the congenital problems of our bodies looking for spiritual signatures? And this, uh, I mean, I know that there are people in this, audience right now, this participants right now, who are the the artists and the experts of this, um, that is, and uh, and I also have my light here, I see Nora, she's the one who teaches me much of this. There's the body and there's the soul and the interaction is tremendous. So the, the every, every, everything is psychosomatic. Anything that happens to your body, if you feel it, it happens to your soul. You Pain only is a soul-based thing. So if someone hits you, and you don't know it, then you don't, and you don't feel pain, then there's nothing. But there's an effect of pain is the soul saying there's something that's happening. And so the body, it can be a caller to the soul, but then the soul also calls to the body. So that's how we, the soul can leave its mark or her mark on the body. So we have this back and forth where the body is influencing and, and molding and developing the soul, but the soul is also giving her influence and development into the body. So, uh, and that's how, so you can look at uh, the marks on your body, uh, chakras and all these kinds of things to find out what's happening from your body, what's happening from the inside. So certainly you look to yourself to find out what is it I need to learn. And so uh, I have a particular pain in a certain area. It's always, and then Nora gives me the explanation of where this means psychically or inside me. And then I can see that and say, this is telling me to look at this thing in my life. And that's part of the path is to find out what's happening to you uh, from the evidence of the body. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, please. Uh, Mohammed Reza Salamat has a question. Please, Bismillah. Un undo your mic and go ahead. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your presentation. I have a question which is similar to the question raised by the previous uh, friend. I understand, uh, as you explained, uh, Ibn Arabi's, uh, in fact, philosophy is based on unity of existence. So, so that's why perhaps he says, that even in Kafirin, those who cover up, if in fact they have uh, nobody in their heart but God. So it, I get the impression that uh, Kafirin or Kuffar even are more uh, likable to God or more closer to God, which I'm not uh, sure if that impression is correct. It's very much consistent with, uh, with what we learn from, from the Quran in which God says, uh, Mu'minin and Kafirin 
are not the same. It is the Mu'minin who are those who are victorious. Um, having said that, isn't it more tenable to say something like what uh, Mullah Sadra, Sadruddin Shirazi, the 16th, 17th philosopher and mystic, uh, who believed that he did believe in the unity of existence. At the same time, he believed that those who are far uh, from God, who are not good people, they have less enjoyment of existence. So there are degrees of existence. Although there is one existence, the unity of existence, but not all of us have the same degree of enjoyment of existence. So um, if we are not good people, it means we are far from existence, far from God. So there should be some sort of differentiation somehow. I, it seems to me that this philosophy of um, degrees of existence makes more sense. If Can you clarify that? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Well, so that's philosophy, <laughs> and so, but I, but I have to leave philosophy for, for you to look at all that because, and that these are fascinating questions to look at these different philosophies and then Sahrawardi and, and so on. Yes. But let me just look at one place you said the the Mu'mini and the Kafirin, the ones who are victorious. But the word victorious here is also assisted, given assistance. And what's happened in this, if you look at this from Ibn Arabi's what he's just taught us, he's saying that the kafir is not assisted. So they're not given any help. And so that's why they are in pain, because they're not given this kind of help. Um, so the, the kafir is the one who has, had, is also the love that God has, uh, Allah has for some of these, some of them are that because they've covered up, they are, they have not let other things into them. They have not let other things into them. And so they are, in a sense, isolated and directly dedicated to the divine. So that's why some of the, the people who are the most beloved of Allah are in the guise or the disguise of the most enemy uh, or the, the biggest enemies of Allah. And so this is, this is a disguise. And, uh, and this is a disguise because of, of jealousy. And so... Uh, so this, so it be, it's a it's a big thing. But this is one reason that we can't take, we can't make a systematic philosophy out of all of this because these are this is a truth, and this is a truth, and you can't really uh, connect all of these truths together and make one single statement. And if there were one single statement that could be done, Ibn Arabi said, I would have made that statement. And he said, but I, what I really want, Ibn Arabi says, what I really wanted was be able to do a divine kitabah a divine little book in which all of these things would be put and they could be just a sentence or two. But that is not a sentence that's reductionist. It's a sentence that would then look at all of them because he said that the Prophet Muhammad had brought out two books. One book he brought out says, in here are the names of everyone and their ancestors and, and all of the people in their tribe and, and where they, and are they going to the fire or are they going to the, garden which are the two sisters and in this book and so in a book a book containing all of these names so Ibn Arabi said I wish I had such a book because I would put all of this into such a book and it would be just a few sentences but it wouldn't be you see it wouldn't be a total sentence it wouldn't be a sum it would be all the details in a tiny book so this is what we're looking for the tiny book which has all the details and doesn't collapse them or reduce them into a single sentence or a single idea and this is the reason that someone like me can will enjoy reading ibn arabi for years and years and years because there's never you never come to the end of it it's always something new so Yeah, uh, we have a, a, a last comment then. Okay, uh, uh, let me do this last comment and then Omar, I think, say, uh, when we make a decision, the scientists say that the decision was made in the brain 0.5 seconds before. So in reality, we think we have free will. So this, is, this, this kind of uh, insight has been, is very helpful to, because we have an idea of how the world works. I make this decision and free will and all these kinds of things. Uh, but to look at how things are happening beyond us um, is very important. And so this is that interconnection of all things. To go back to that slide of the vast earth, this fabric. So if the fabric is there, then the things that make event X happen aren't the things that happened around X. So when 
the Count of Monte Cristo gets to hear Mercedes say Edmond for the first time, it's 20 years ago, Heidi was bit by a falcon. So in other words, the, is, is the event can be described locally, or do you have to go non-locally to describe the event? And the answer for Ibn Arabi is that you have to go non-locally because this, as the Allah said, from Allah's heart to Allah's heart. So that becomes that's such a um, inducing and, uh, and, and beautiful statement. Uh, Omar has something, and then we can we'll call it a day. Uh, on, on, in slide eight, if you can just elaborate a little bit on an aspect that you mentioned that um, covering up, those, by covering up, uh, one can end up seeing God in, an, in a mundane, in a profane thing through covering up. I couldn't establish that link. I didn't understand it. Yeah, so, um, so all things are indicative of God, but then as we said that Allah interrogates or, or, or asks questions of the lover. So if you say, I love you, Allah, then Allah will, will test you or interrogate you and say, is it because of my nice adjectives that you love me or is it because of other things? And the same way for the person, the Arif, the person who recognizes God everywhere, they say, okay, you recognize me everywhere. So everything you see, you say, oh, there's God, there's God, there's God. And that's wonderful. But Allah still can interrogate you and say, ah, but is it really me that you are looking for? And if Allah gives you this, this drink of water or this event or this person or this teacher or whatever it is, gives you that. And then say, let's see if you're loyal to that. And so when the pain comes for holding on to something, so kufr is being covered up and holding on to something and saying, this one is special. So the moment you say this one is special, then you enter into a world of pain. And so, but this is Allah's test to say, can you hold on to something that's special, be loyal to it and say, this is Allah for me. And then Allah says, that person truly loves me. So Ibn Abi is kind of saying, because he'll say every mosque is the same, every place is the same, you can find God everywhere. But then he says, some mosque you find your heart more than another mosque. And are you loyal to that? And so loyalty entails pain. <laughs> so that's sort of the, the, the bad news. Uh, but what, has, what that beautiful statement that Ibn Arabi says that, that Allah then says, and I will never be displeased with them or unhappy with them ever. So Alhamdulillah. So thank you very much. So it's so good to see you. And, and now I get to see all the faces. So that's wonderful. And I'm glad that you put all your the chats in there. It's good to see you. Okay. And so.